So John chapter 1, uh, open in your Bibles today to John chapter 1, and we will be in verses 19 through 34 today. Last week we kicked off this series, uh, reading through, studying through John's gospel, and John was Jesus's best friend, right? He knew Jesus better than anybody else. He was his closest friend, his most, most faithful friend. He never left Jesus' side throughout his whole ministry. He was there at the cross when Jesus was crucified. Uh, he was the first one uh, to see the, uh, to, to, first of the disciples to see the empty tomb. He beat P Peter in a foot race to the tomb. He was so excited about his best friend who had come from the dead. So he writes uh, to us this gospel, the story of Jesus' life, and he writes to it, he writes it to us intentionally. How many of you, you've ever had somebody tell you a story and about midway through you're just wondering, why in the world are you telling me this? I, wh why are you telling me this and these details? I can't, you know, where is this going? Uh, that happens to me a lot sometimes and, you know, anyway, it, it usually ends up somewhere. But John, he tells us in chapter 20 of his gospel why he wrote this book for us. He said these, that Jesus did many signs in the presence of disciples, uh, many of which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is why John sits down to pen this gospel for us, so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer. That's John's intent for you as we study this and we read this. And that's, that's our hope and prayer for you too, is that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing in him, by that faith, you would have eternal life, life in his name. Last week, we, we learned that Jesus is the light that came into the world. That Jesus was with God in the beginning. That Jesus is God. And that through Jesus the world was created. That everything that we see, all of creation, came through Jesus Christ, the eternal word. As God proclaimed, let there be light. And God created the world through Jesus Christ. And that Jesus is God. And we learned last week that this light that came into the world also brings life. It gives life. It's this light that gives life, that we were dead in our sins, but God made us alive in Christ, that the life gives light, that those who believe in Jesus are born again. There's this new life. And that as we are born again, that we are now sons and daughters of the one true living God. If you believe in Jesus and you've been saved, you've been born again, you are a child of God. A child of God. You are his son. You are his daughter. Think about your own children and the love and affection that you have for them. It doesn't even compare to how God feels about you as, a, as his child. This week, we're going to be studying... Um, as we, we're going to look at the life of John the Baptist in our text this week. And as we get into it, we're going to see some of the essential qualities uh, that are necessary for Christian witness. You know, I think all of us kind of have this idea uh, that we ought to be telling people about Jesus. Those of us who are born again, we have this eternal life. We've found new life in Christ we have this, I think we have this sense that, hey, we ought, more people ought to know about this, right? Hey, we don't want to hold it to ourselves, but we want to share it. I think we all kind of have that sense. But oftentimes, I think if you're anything like me, you might also feel like, I'm probably not doing the best job of this as I could be. Or that's just me. Okay, great. <laughs> the pastor's the only problem, person who has a problem with this. Wonderful. We're going to be looking at witnessing uh, today. Um, and I, I have to be honest with you. I have to confess to you. Um, I was very convicted uh, this week, and especially yesterday as uh, I was studying the text, that uh, 
I, I, need, to, I, I need to be walking more in this in a greater way, uh, being more intentional about sharing my faith. Uh, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, I had a, an incredible opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, and I didn't do it. And the thing that really grieved me was not the fact that I didn't do it, but the fact that I didn't even think about doing it until I was driving away. I'm just confessing to you today. I, I want you to know that this is, I'm not preaching down to anybody today. I'm right here with you walking through this together. Um, and by the grace of God, I think this is something we can all grow in together. Amen? So today we're going to be looking at the life of John the Baptist and uh, he was this messenger. We're going to look at his, him as the messenger. And we're going to look at his message. So we're going to look at the messenger and the message. And then from this, I believe we can extrapolate some of the essentials uh, for Christian witness. Uh, yeah, yesterday, I, I, had, I was at Starbucks. Uh, I'm there almost all the time. And so I was there as I usually am. And I'm just kidding. I'm not always there. But anyway, I was there. <laughs> I was there, and uh, a gentleman came up to me and said, hey, I don't have any money. I'm hungry. Can you buy me something to eat? And I didn't have any money either, so I, I said, sorry, I don't, I don't have any cash. And I got in my car. I started my car, and then I felt convicted. Go buy this, go buy this guy a sandwich. And so I, got, I stopped my car. I got out and went and I got the guy. I said, look, they got sandwiches in here. Let me buy you a sandwich. So I bought him a sandwich. I told him about the church. I said, hey, I'm the pastor of this church down the street. You ought to come visit us sometime. I told them about our food pantry. I said, hey, if you need food, hey, we, 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 give, we give out food. Um, come fill up a grocery bag, and, and we'd be, love to serve you, and blah, blah, blah. I got to hear a little bit about him. And then I, I left, <laughs> and I was driving off in my car, and I was like, I told him about the church. I told him about me, the pastor. I told him about the food, the pantry. And I didn't tell him about Jesus. What and what and, and so I just I, and then <laughs> I was leaving to come and study for today, and then I opened my Bible and the whole thing is about witnessing, and I'm like, <laughs> this is so horrible, and so I I just I want you to know that that um, I, we're gonna do a better job, I'm gonna do a better job, and it's not just. From this, there's some things that I learned that, that can help us do a better job. Um, and I think it'll help you too. And uh, we need to tell more people about Jesus. Amen. Let's pray before we get into the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, God, I thank you that you came as that light which gives life to mankind. Lord, we have that light inside of us. Help us, oh God, to reflect your glory as we are now the light of the world. Help us uh, by your spirit to empower us to be the witnesses that you've called us to be, that we would uh, be able to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about this light and this life, this eternal life, to tell people the truth and to tell people the grace. Lord, I thank you for uh, your church who's here today. God, as we open your word, I pray that it would be your word speaking to your people, that you would continually perfect us and, 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 and just encourage those who need to be encouraged today, uplift those who need to be uplifted today. Lord, I pray that where we're falling short, that you would convict our hearts, that you would lead us into repentance, and that through that, we might better model you to the world around us. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 1, we're going to be looking at John the Baptist, and in, in last week's text, there, there was a little parenthesis about John the Baptist, and that was in verse 6, and it says this, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The, the period of time that leads up to 
Jesus coming on the scene and this, this prophet, John the Baptist, coming on the scene uh, was an incredible period of time. God's people, the, the Israelites, had this incredible relationship with God as he had chosen them and he had related to them. And he would send his prophets to speak to them on his behalf. He would send the prophets to speak to the leadership, to speak to the kings, to give direction and correction for how these people were to lead God's people, his chosen people. But 400 years before Christ, God became silent. There were no prophets between Malachi, the last prophet, And John the Baptist showing up on the scene. There was no word from God for 400 years. 400 years is a long time. Uh, 400 years ago, there there was no United States of America. You you think about everything that happens in 400 years. Think about just the last 100 years. All the wars that have been fought. All the people that have lived and died. And for 400 years, God did not speak. He was silent. In this period of time, the the Roman Empire had come in and occupied Palestine, occupied Israel. And so now God's people are living in oppression under Rome. Their, their, Their reach had spread so far out. It had spread all the way from Rome, Italy, all the way to Palestine. And now... Israel is living under the Roman rule. But they're still performing their worship. They're still uh, performing these sacred acts. And so there's a a priest whose name is Zechariah. He's a Levite. Him and his wife, they haven't been able to have kids. It says that they were advanced in age. That's just the Bible's nice way of saying they were old. Their baby-making days were done, okay? They weren't going to have kids. They just hadn't had kids. And, and Zechariah, it says that he, they, they cast lots and, and he, he won the draw. He got the great honor of being able to go into the temple in Jerusalem to offer incense as worship before God. And so one day as he's fulfilling his priestly duty in the temple, worshiping God, All the people are outside praying. The angel Gabriel shows up in the room with him. Now, this isn't a big room. I mean, this is, you know, he's in there by himself offering incense. God hasn't spoken for 400 years. There hasn't been a prophet. There hasn't been an angel. There has been nothing. And he's in there offering incense. And I can just imagine him out of the corner of his eyes. All of a sudden, there's somebody else in the room with him. I would be thinking, oh no, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing so wrong that that God had to send an angel to come and and correct me? It says that fear gripped his heart. Have you ever been at home, you thought you were alone, but somebody else was there? They they walk in the room and and there's a scream that's let out. That happens to my wife all the time. She... she, I I don't know, she... walk into the room and she didn't think I was there and it's, it scares her. Man, it's, when someone shows up that you're not expecting, especially an angelic being, when God hasn't done anything for 400 years, it says that fear gripped his heart. He was afraid. But Gabriel tells him, don't be afraid. I've got good news. You're going to bear a son. You're going to bear a son. Call his name John. And in Luke chapter 1, we see this, 16 and 17, Uh, He gives this, uh, Gabriel tells Zechariah about his son John that he will turn many of the children of Israel back to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John is, is sent into the world as a witness, to bear witness about the light, to to prepare the world, to prepare people for the coming Messiah, for Jesus who was coming, the light, into the world. The angel instructed his parents that 
He was supposed to be a Nazarite. He was supposed to take this special vow before the Lord. He was supposed to separate himself. John was to separate himself from birth for ministry, for this high calling that God had prepared for him as a prophet. And so part of this Nazarite vow was you, you didn't cut your hair or shave your beard. So John never cut his hair or shaved his beard. He's, he's older than Jesus, so he's about 30 years old when he's out there in the wilderness. I, I googled what somebody looks like who they haven't cut their hair in 30 years. It's crazy. It's so long. And a beard, can you imagine a beard? You know, I could grow my beard for 30 years and it wouldn't, you would never even be able to see it because I can't do it. <laughs> Ramiro, five minutes after he shaves, he's, he's got a beard. I mean, he's just... So I don't know what kind of beard John had. But he's out there in the wilderness proclaiming, make ready the way of the Lord. He's preaching a message of repentance. He's saying, turn from sin. Trust in God, and he's baptizing people as a symbol of their repentance, of cleansing. John was an interesting dude. He dressed in camel hair. I also Google imaged camel hair. It's, it's bizarre. I, I just have this picture of John where you couldn't tell where his beard stopped and his camel hair started, and he was just out there in the desert yelling at people. Telling them to repent. And it goes on to say that on his lunch breaks, he pulled out his sack and he pulled out locusts and he dipped them in honey. I don't, uh, how many of you have ever eaten locusts and honey? I, maybe it's good. I don't know. Maybe it's, I mean, to me it sounds strange. I don't know anybody who does that. I've never been out to lunch with anybody at Chili's and they order the John the Baptist salad and they bring out, you know, locusts and honey on a bed of lettuce. I've never seen that. It's, it's unusual. It's unusual. And so John is this unusual character out in the desert yelling at people, proclaiming God is on his way, the Messiah is coming, the kingdom of God is at hand, you better repent. You better get your life right. And people are showing up. People are coming out in droves. It says that, uh, I, it doesn't say how many people were coming, but it was enough to get people's, the, 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 the Jewish leader's attention in Jerusalem from the temple. And so they send a delegation of people to ask John what he's doing. So it's not just him and the three other people that are out there hanging out in the water, you know, cruising down the river. This is a multitude of people, several hundred, possibly several thousand, that have come out to hear John preach, who are repenting of their sin, who are turning to God, and are being baptized. And this is where we pick up the story uh, in our text today in John chapter 1, verse 19. It says that this is the testimony of John... When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So John's influence has grown to the point where it's, it's attracted the attention of the, the, the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day, the priests and the Levites. And so they send a delegation out into the desert to find out who this guy John is. What's he doing out there? They ask him, who are you? What, what, this is strange. We, you remember, there hasn't been a prophet for 400 years. And here someone is showing up with a prophetic message. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your sin, trust in God. The Messiah is on his way. They ask, who are you? Verse 20, John confessed and did not, did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. He says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Savior. I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, well, then are you Elijah? That's kind of an interesting question. 
They're going to go on to ask him, are you the prophet? In the Old Testament, these are two uh, prophecies of, of, of people who were going to come that the Jewish people were expecting. They were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting Elijah to come back. And they were expecting a prophet like Moses who would mediate between God and man for them. And so that's why they ask him these three things. Are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, then who are you? What are you doing out here? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Here we start to see a glimpse of John's personality. He quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Here we see in this section the first characteristic of essential witness as a Christian. It, it takes boldness. It takes some boldness. This guy, John, he's a pretty bold guy. He, he, had, he, he, was, he was bold from his choice of clothing to his hairstyle to his lunch. I mean, this guy was a bold guy. And on top of that, his message was even more bold. And we'll get to that in verse 29. But he was boldly proclaiming repentance. But we also see here, we start to see the other essential part of Christian witness is humility. See, a witness doesn't receive the glory for themselves. John could have very easily set up John the Baptist ministries. You know, First Baptist Church of the Wilderness. You know, I mean, he could have, he could have set that up. Amassed a, you know, tried to... to, to solidify his following, you know, written books, how to baptize in three easy steps. You know, he could, have, he could have done that. But what does he say? I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice out here making noise, crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. I'm just a voice. I'm not the word. Last week we learned about the word, that eternal word that came into the world. He's saying, I'm not the substance, but I'm just the communicator. Continuing in verse 24, it says, now these had been sent from the Pharisees, this delegation, the Pharisees had sent uh, this delegation. We're going to learn a lot about the Pharisees over the next coming weeks. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? They're saying, who, who gave you this authority? Who do you think you are out here telling us to repent? Where do you get your authority from? Why are you doing this? I love how John pivots here. John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Speaking of Jesus. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. I love how John moves the emphasis away from himself. These people are here showing up to see John. And what does John do? It's not about me, it's about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the Savior who's coming into the world. Let me tell you about the one who's coming after me. He turns the conversation off of himself and he points people to Jesus Christ. This is the second hallmark of essential Christian witness is humility. The first is boldness, but the second one is this humility. John says that Jesus is so high 
and I am so low. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his shoes. In, in this day and age, it was the, 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 the service of washing people's feet was reserved for the lowest people on the totem pole, for the lowest of the low. And here John is saying, Jesus is so high, I'm not even worthy to touch his shoes. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. And sometimes we think of boldness as people who are bold, maybe they're proud, maybe they're arrogant, maybe they're, they're confident, they have a lot of self-confidence. But John's boldness, I would submit, is not based on his confidence in himself, but rather based on his humility. It's not based on pride in himself. His boldness to proclaim clearly this message is in relation to his humility, his high view of Jesus Christ. We think of people who are bold as, as proud, arrogant. No, we're not talking about that. The source of John's boldness is not pride, but it's humility. As he's humbled himself under Jesus Christ, he's willing, he's totally un, un, unworried about what anybody would think about him. Because he's going out there to fulfill the task that God gave him. He's going out there more concerned about what God thinks about him than anybody else. And so if we're going to be an effective witness for Jesus, we've got to get, a, get over worrying about how we're going to look. If we're going to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, we've got, we got to get over worrying about what we're going to look like. Now, I'm not telling you to go wear camel hair. I'm not telling you to pack a sack lunch of crickets at work. That's not what I'm telling you. But what I am telling you is, when you see Christ for who he really is, it humbles you. It humbles you. And you start to realize, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about what I look like. If I need to look like a fool for the sake of Christ, so be it. So be it. You see, if we make, thing, if we make it about ourselves instead of Jesus, we'll never witness. We'll never witness. If we're only concerned about how we're going to look, we'll never share the gospel. And in that, it's actually pride that would keep us from witnessing. All of us, every single one of us who are a Christian, who have been born again, have fallen short in this area. I know, I know it. We've been standing there with somebody in front of us with the Holy Spirit telling us, tell them about Jesus. And a million reasons, good reasons, come through our head. I got to get going. I'm late for prayer meeting. You know, I haven't read my Bible today. I need to get in the Word. I mean, it's just a million. What are they going to think about me? I just yelled at my wife. She's standing right next to me. How in the world could I witness? I haven't repented yet. And what are we making it about? I, me, it's pride. It's pride. Pride that needs repented of. So we see that John is humble because he continually shifts the focus in the glory onto Jesus Yet, he's bold. He's strange, <laughs> yet he's incredibly effective in his ministry. He's a little bit abrasive, yet he's very anointed. So the two essential qualities for Christian witness are humility and boldness. That's the messenger of John the Baptist. Verse 29 is his message. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
This is what John came to do. He sees Jesus coming towards him. And he cries out, behold. We don't use that word anymore. You know, if we see something really unique or interesting, we don't say, behold, look at this thing that I have found. John is saying, look, stop, pay attention, stop what you're doing. It's right in front of you. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In this one sentence, we have the essence of the entire Christian message. This is why I love John's gospel. It's so tightly packed. In this one sentence is the entire essence of the Christian message. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In this message, we have sin and forgiveness. We have death, the sacrificial lamb. We see life. We see a savior. And we see a sacrifice. The, ascent, the, the, the Christian message is that sin has separated us from God. That all of us have sin. And that this sin has separated us from the life and the light. That all of us have sinned against God by nature and by choice. That this all-powerful, all-knowing, cosmic creator created us, fashioned us, formed us, loved us, and we rebelled against him. We rebelled. And this sin that came into the world brought death, disease, destruction, wars. Everything we look out and see in the world today, we live in this fallen and broken world. But John proclaims, behold, <laughs> the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For a first century person, for a first century Jew who had grown up under the, the sacrificial system of offering sacrifices to atone for sin, who had grown up under the law of Moses, they would have known what he was talking about. When we sing about the Lamb and, 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 and we read about the Lamb of God, this is what we're referring to as this, this atoning for sin. We're a little bit disconnected from this because in our culture we don't, you know, we're not around sheep and lambs and goats and bulls. I mean, I know we got the rodeo in town, but um, to a first century Jewish person, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because they had grown up under this system of constantly, daily, having to atone for their sin. Because sin requires a payment. Sin must be atoned for. Hebrews tells us that without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so they constantly grew up atoning for sin. They would have thought, they would have known the scriptures and they would have remembered when Isaac and Abraham were walking up the mountain and Isaac said, Father, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. God himself will provide a lamb. They would have thought back to the, to the Passover when when right before the, the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, the lamb was sacrificed and the blood covered their doorpost. They would have thought of Isaiah 53, which talks about the lamb being led to the slaughter. They knew exactly what he was talking about. While the law was good and while the law was perfect, there was nothing wrong with the law. As we studied Galatians, we learned that the law had one shortcoming. It couldn't produce life. The, the, the sacrifices of these animals, it could cover, it could, it could cover the sin. 
but it couldn't take it away. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. While they could atone for their sin, they couldn't be set free from it. They couldn't be made alive. They couldn't be born again because the law could not give life. Paul in Romans chapter 8 says that Jesus accomplished on the cross what the law could not do, weakened by sinful flesh. The problem wasn't with the law. The problem's with our hearts. And that Jesus came and he did what the law could not do. He causes us to pass from death to life. 2 Corinthians 5 says that for all who are in Christ, we are a new creation. That we are born again. We have passed from death to life. Even though we continue to live in this world, <laughs> our sins are atoned for. If you are in Christ, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are paid for. But we still live in this world. And we will live in this broken world under the effects of sin until Christ returns. Part of what we face in this world is death as, an, as, a, and as, as a consequence of sin. That all of us will die one day. I was flipping through the channels uh, the other night and I came across, it said, The Kingdom of God. I thought, that sounds interesting. So it's a movie. I didn't know it was a movie, but it was a movie. And it was about these people fighting over Jerusalem and the Crusades and all of this stuff. And anyway, this one guy's friend, the main character's friend, he was going off to battle. So the main character was telling his friend, Don't go to battle because you're going to lose and you're going to lose badly. If you go off to, to face this enemy, you're going off to certain death. And his friend, who was already on his horse, heading off into battle, said, all death is certain. All death is certain. All of us will die. Our bodies are going to wear out. But we don't put our hope in this life only. That just as Jesus Christ died he also rose again and because he rose again we too who are in Christ will rise again glorified just as he was glorified but on top of that when you get all the way to the end of the Bible the the prophetic revelation in Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 Jesus is sitting on the throne He's conquered Satan, he's conquered death, he's conquered sin. Finally, completely eradicated it. And you know what he's saying? Behold, I am making all things new. That Jesus is the Lamb of God who not only atones for our sin, but takes it completely away. All of the effects of it, the death, the disease, the heartache, the hurt, all of it will be taken away. Doesn't simply cover it. Doesn't simply mask it. Doesn't simply sweep it under the rug. That for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, it takes it away. It breaks the power of it in your life. So you no longer have to struggle. In our witness, we must not lose sight of the message. This is the message. Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sin. That he died the death I deserved. He paid the price I should have paid. And because he rose again, I too can be resurrected. In this life, I can receive eternal life. And in the life to come, all things will be made new. All things, all the effects of sin will be taken away. The power of the curse completely broken. As I was worshiping this morning, we were 
singing songs about the Lamb. We were singing songs about Jesus. And I just, again, felt the sense and the weight of Christ and his work for me. Me. Not just for the world, but for me. That Christ died for me because of his love for me. He atoned for my sin, of which <laughs> there are many. That my sin put Jesus on the cross. That I crucify <laughs> the Son of God. John continues in verse 30. John the Baptist's testimony. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. He's saying Jesus is eternal. Jesus existed before I was even a, a thought. Jesus was before me. He's above me. He says, I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water. He's saying, I didn't know who the Messiah was. I didn't know who the Christ was going to be. But I came baptizing. I came preaching. I came prophesying that he would be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me. He on whom you see the spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. God told John the Baptist go out there and preach. Go out there and baptize. You're going for this purpose to reveal the Messiah to the world. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about the one that's coming after you. You are going to be a witness. And here is the sign. Watch for it. The one on whom you see the Holy Spirit descend, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. John says, I have seen. And I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Jesus doesn't just cover our sin. He takes it away. It's as if we never sinned. When we're resurrected to new life, it will, our bodies will not ache. We will have no more hurts, emotional wounds, scars that we carry for the rest of this life will be removed. All of the effects of the fall, all of the effects of sin will be taken away. But on top of it, on top of it all, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That in this life, we can be filled with the Spirit of God. To help us overcome sin. To help us live a life of righteousness and holiness and purity. To empower us to be the witnesses that God has called us to be. That we can minister to people. That we can lay our hands upon people and pray for them. And the Spirit of God can work through us. Bringing healing, bringing hope, bringing salvation. The Spirit of God working through us. John says, I have seen and borne witness that Jesus is the Son of God. Why don't we stand this morning? Let's stand in an in a attitude of Sincerity and reverence, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes.
and give everybody an opportunity to respond to God's word today. If you're here today, and maybe you're a little bit like me and you are feeling convicted about your Christian witness, about your willingness to share this message that Jesus takes away sin. And you would like just God to fill you with a, a new awe of him that would lead you into humility and that that humility would lead you into a boldness to tell the people around you about this Jesus, the Lamb of God. If that's you here today and you would just say, I want to have that boldness. I want to have that humility. I want God to fill me with his spirit afresh and anew today that I might go out and be the witness that he's called me to be. Why don't you just slip up your hand this morning as a, a way of responding? 